through. Um, so Lauren and Dwayne will be doing the PowerPoint and we will hear their voices. And if you need to ask questions, there's two ways you can do that. Um, you'll see on the control panel, uh, you'll see a hand icon. And so if you press that, we know that you have a question. All I ask is that you reserve all the questions for the end of the presentation. So make a note uh, for yourself uh, of the question you'd like to ask. Or another way we can do it is uh, that you, um, in the chat box, uh, you ask me the question and um, and I will get it to the presenters and then again they can uh, more than likely answer it at the at the end of the uh, presentation just so we can keep things uh, moving along. And uh, if you have any technical difficulties uh, we can try to help you with that as well so again if you if you put that in the chat box um, in your control panel um, we can try to figure that out for you here as well and we can write uh, back to you. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren and Dwayne. Okay, thanks everybody for listening. This is Lauren Legge, your EMS Fellow for the Year, and Dwayne Cotel, your Pre-Hospital Care Specialist Extraordinaire, here to talk to you about a topic that's come up several times in the past. Meds that are on some of the trucks, but not in your directives. So these meds specifically are Lasix and Bicarb. They themselves are only for ACP paramedics, but of course this information will be very helpful for anyone involved in patient care to understand what and why things have changed. So specifically, Lasix is currently only carried by MLEMS, and all ACP services carry bicarb on the trucks. So our specific objectives today are to describe the pathophysiology of acute pulmonary edema, describe the current evidence for pre-hospital furosemide or Lasix administration, appropriately apply the use of pre-hospital furosemide based on patient assessment and current evidence, list the three primary indications for sodium bicarb admin, describe the current evidence for pre-hospital sodium administ admin bicarb administration, and appropriately apply the use of pre-hospital sodium bicarb based on patient assessment and current evidence. Bit of a mouthful. So without any further ado, let's talk about furosemide or Lasix. So when we look at heart failure, uh, just a quick review, uh, we, we can utilize Lasix in the uh, patient who's suffering from acute cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema. Um, about 5 to 6% of all pre-hospital cases uh, end up with uh, decompensating heart failure. So when we think of pulmonary edema or left-sided heart failure, uh, we think, think of it like the heart is a forward pump. So it's like a car that's in drive and it should be driving forward. And then what happens when the right side of the heart fails, uh, there's uh, the peripheral uh, vascular resistance and then we have a lot of pressure building up. And then in turn, that car, picture it's spinning on ice now and then it's actually sliding backwards, uh, even though it's trying to drive forward. Uh, the fluid, uh, uh, there's a, a leakage and a, a displacement of fluid and that goes back in and the pressures become too great and they uh, penetrate the alveoli and it's at a higher pressure so it's, it moves back into the lungs. Uh, at that point, um, and these people have shortness of breath and uh, crackles upon auscultation. So. so with regards to heart failure, how does it present? We've all seen different types of heart failure patients. So they could have acute pulmonary edema, which is what we're going to be talking about today. They might be in cardiogenic shock. They might be in hypertensive crisis, or they might be those types of patients that have 20 plus pounds of fluid on with chronic heart failure. So on top of the multitude of ways in which it can present, it's actually pretty hard to diagnose. There was a paper in 2002 by McCall et al. that talked about the accuracy of diagnosis of emergency physicians were only 74%. So these people that presented that they thought were in CHF, 74% of those patients were, but over a quarter of them were not. Uh, this has been found time and time again. Uh, some of the CPAP trials, which we talked about uh, when we switched over to CPAP in our trucks, showed a similar thing up to about a third of patients who we think are in uh, pulmonary edema, in fact, aren't. Um, basically, the trouble with these patients are that, as we talked about, it's a very heterogeneous population. And as we go on to talk about uh, Lasix on the rest of this presentation, Basically, these patients are hard to describe from other patients that have shortness of breath, NYD. So going on to talk about acute pulmonary edema as CHF, 
So <clears throat> remember, congestive heart failure, it is complex, uh, and it can present a number of different ways. Uh, one is one of which is, is acute uh, pulmonary edema. So when we look at this, we can break it down into cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. As we know, cardiogenic, it's an increase in back pressure, uh, which leads the, uh, the heart's inability to pump forward, and we end up in that left side heart failure. Um, when we start looking at non-cardiogenic uh, properties, it's just it's an increase basically of, of leakiness. Okay, and that can stem from heroin overdose, uh, uh, near drowning or drowning, particularly salt water, aspiration, and there are some just unknown causes, fluid in the alveoli for some unknown reason. At the end of the day, it's excessive fluid in the lungs. Um, and when we look at uh, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, it can be from uh, the increased microvascular hydrostatic pressure. Uh, that's the cardiogenic, and then the non-cardiogenic, just from increased capillary permeability. Uh, we start looking into our SERS patients and sepsis patients, they fall into the non-cardiogenic, uh, pulmonary infections, uh, severe trauma, uh, toxic inhalations, uh, and, and, and aspiration from uh, stomach contrast or gastric contrast. But at the end of the day, the result is the same. There is an excessive accumulation of extravascular lung fluid. And although they uh, there's very different causes, they present, they do present similar. Um, they have those same type of clinical uh, manifestations. So the, uh, the dyspnea, the diaphoresis, a decreased lung compliance, uh, anxiety, and increased shunting function. And it's, uh, it, it is very difficult to distinguish between um, uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema and pneumonia. There's been a number of studies, uh, Contopoly in 84, uh, and so there's a study there. and you can notice that it's, it's very complex, it, it can be very unclear, and the signs and symptoms and presentation, we all see this, uh, they, they look the same, uh, but there's some subtleties we have to kind of look for. So there are, there are some trends in what we're going to start to look at. So if we can, uh, we're going to throw out a poll question to everybody, um, and the question is, what is the medication of choice for acute pulmonary edema? Uh, so A, Lasix, B, Nitro, C, Ventolin, or D, Morphine. So we'll give you a few seconds to, if the polls are open, you can go ahead and answer, answer the polls. Okay, so uh, we'll close the polls and we'll see what everybody said. Okay, so with respect to the first poll question, 85% identified nitro as the choice of medication. So the correct answer is B, uh, it's nitroglycerin, um, and that reduces the afterload. So basically that car can, can just keep driving forward. Perfect. So moving on to the treatment of heart failure then. So good job, everybody. 85% is pretty good there. So kind of one of those dogmas of medicine is the treatment of heart failure. So if you've heard uh, of something called LMNOP, so Lasix, morphine, nitrates, oxygen, and positive pressure. So in a hospital, sometimes you'll see people receiving LMNOP. Uh, Pre-hospital, in our directives, we have NOP nitro, oxygen, and CPAP. We'll touch on that later. Time to open again to another poll question. Okay, so poll question here. Uh, which of the following is a contraindication for CPAP? So A, crackles upon auscultation. B, tripod positioning. Uh, a C, a COPD patient. Or D, asthma exacerbation in your expect, uh, expect, suspected. So we're going to open the polls up, take about Give five, ten seconds to go ahead and answer that. Okay, so we'll close the polls and we'll see what everybody had to say. Okay, so on this poll, it looks like 84% of people identified asthma exacerbation I suspect that is the right answer. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. Uh, yeah. D is the correct answer. Um, 
and we all know CPAP does work, uh, but there are uh, lots of contraindications to it, and asthma is one of them. Awesome. So touching back on the heart failure treatment again, looking at the evidence for, again, the dogma of medicine being LMNOP, with regards to Lasix, uh, we'll examine that evidence in length. So we'll leave that for a minute, going to M, the morphine. It's actually been found to increase the need for ICU stay in previous studies, it might be due to the hypotensive hypotension that it gives. But if there's never been any studies that have proven that it actually helps on its own, which is why we don't recommend it pre-hospital. With regards to nitrates, uh, they have been found to help. As we um, talked about with our last poll question, it decreases uh, the pressure on the heart and has actually been found to decrease mortality in studies. Oxygen we give to help with oxygenation. And positive pressure, as we talked about um, in our last poll question, we know it works and it works quite well. So there was a study by Hubble in 2006 that showed the number needed to treat to show a decrease in morbidity mortality was six. So six people need to be treated with BiPAP to have um, an effect. And as well, our own Samir Mal, who is a previous pre-hospital fellow, did a meta-analysis that was published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2014, which showed a reduction of in-hospital mortality of NNT of 18, so 18 people that need to be treated to save a life, and a need for invasive ventilation, or basically don't need to be intubated, an NNT of 8, which is why we use it in pre-hospital setting, and which is why we recapped some of the contraindications. So it's an awesome uh, treatment modality, and then knowing when we should and should not use it. So N, proven evidence. O, we use that to help with oxygenation, and positive pressure, definitely evidence for its use, which is why we recommend the NOP. So now we'll talk about Lasix. So what is it? It's a loop diuretic, so it works in the loop of Henle in our kidneys. So basically, it stops sodium from being pulled back in, which lets the water continue through the tract, which decreases your volume. So it has its peak effect in about five minutes, symptom effect in about 15 to 20 minutes, and lasts for about a total of two hours. So let's look at the evidence for its use. So it has had some uh, hemodynamic benefit in that it decreases the pulmonary pressures and offsets the uh, right atrial pressures, which unloads the LV, so hopefully getting a little bit of forward flow. However, when we actually look at the studies, we found that the only positive outcomes have ever been shown when it's been combined with the other treatment modalities. So it's never on its own been found to help. So what we think might actually be a benefit might in fact not really be a benefit as it's never really been found on its own to help. And remember, we get the diagnosis wrong kind of 20 to 40% of the time in the first place, and we'll touch on that again. So some of the adverse effects, uh, adverse effects, pardon me, there's many papers citing specific adverse events, the most common being electrolyte abnormalities because of the way that it works, it decreases your potassium. Hypotension, again, because of the way it works, it decreases the amount of volume you have in your body, which gives you hypovolemia and hypotension, and it's also been associated with uh, death. So looking at the most current evidence, there was a paper done by Steele all out of Ottawa that looked at a population of papers of patients in the Ottawa area over the year 2008, and they examined all patients that received a diagnosis of heart failure who received pre-hospital Lasix. So they took all of the patients of 2008 and split them into three groups. So the patients that received Lasix pre-hospital and then ended up with an emergency department diagnosis of heart failure, those patients that received Lasix pre-hospital and were not diagnosed with heart failure in, patient, in um, the emergency department, and then the third group were those patients that did not receive Lasix pre-hospital and then were diagnosed with heart failure in hospital. So their primary outcome were those four listed there, so death in hospital, acute kidney injury, need for pressors, and need for intubation, all within the patient's first two hours of stay. Their secondary outcome were secondary adverse events. So basically they found that there was no difference in all of those three groups of patients, so those that received Lasix and had an emergency department diagnosis of heart failure, those that received Lasix and were not diagnosed with heart failure, and those that did not receive Lasix pre-hospital and were diagnosed with heart failure for those four things listed there in front of you for their primary outcomes. 
but they did find a difference in the secondary adverse outcome. So let's look at that a little bit closer. So this is the results. So here, there's serious adverse events. Those were, again, those four things we touched on earlier. Looking at the p-values here, you can see that none of them were statistically significant. So in their primary outcomes, they did not find a difference. But they did find a difference in their other adverse outcomes, so their secondary um, outcome methods. So as you can see here, they did find a difference in hypotension, in need for IV fluid bolus, in serious arrhythmia, in electrolyte abnormality, and basically overall adverse outcomes. So although their primary outcome, they did not find a difference, they did in their secondary outcomes. So those patients that were treated with pre-hospital Lasix actually did worse. So why is that? What is the evidence behind this? Essentially, we've touched on it a couple times. The problem is that these patients present with shortness of breath. So do other types of patients, so those with pneumonia, those with COPD, and those with ACS. They're very difficult to diagnose. In hospital where we have x-ray, lab, a nice controlled setting, 20 to 40 percent of the time we get the diagnosis wrong. In the pre-hospital environment, you don't have additional history, you have a very limited physical assessment, and you don't have those labs, the chest x-ray, all those other information that we have in hospital, which is basically the crux of the situation. Um, this here is a photo from a paper by Geronic in 2006, published in pre-hospital care. So on the y-axis there, it shows the percent of patients. On the x-axis, it shows those that were, one, appropriately treated with Lasix out of hospital. The second bar there is those that were um, inappropriately treated out of hospital with Lasix, so basically those that were given Lasix but were not diagnosed with heart failure. And the third column is those that had the inappropriate diagnosis where it was found the treatment with Lasix was potentially harmful. So those that had a diagnosis of sepsis, dehydration, or pneumonia. So this year in our research we really touched on sepsis and about how these patients need fluid these same patients that need fluid can present like those that are in heart failure. And remember how Lasix works, it works by draining you of the fluid you have in your body. So you can see how this heterogeneous population, if treated with Lasix, can actually be quite detrimental. And that's backed up by those studies that show that they need IV fluid bolus um, and have hypotension, etc. So the bottom line is that basic Lasix basically is not very good for pre-hospital. Timing is the question. So is pre-hospital the place? Is eMERGE even the right place? So um, basically the tidal wave is turning and we're finding that there's building evidence not to treat with Lasix in eMERGE as well as pre-hospital. A 2007 study by Shot Harry et al. showed that 50% of those presenting with uh, what they thought was acute pulmonary edema, in fact had no weight gain, so in fact did not have increased fluid. So instead of it being an increase in fluid in the body, it's more of a shift of fluid into the lungs. Yeah. And remember, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the day, um, when you're listening, uh, good chest auscultation, it's fluid in the lungs and being very cognizant of the predisposing factors and their presentation and really listening and getting a good solid history will, will help with our decision for utilizing Lasix or not in an appropriate setting. So really, as we've touched on before, the treatment is not to decrease their volume but to shift the fluid. So not to give Lasix but to give things like the nitro as well as the positive pressure to move the fluid. So evidence-backed treatment is what's in our protocols, the nitrates, the oxygen, and the positive pressure. So now let's talk about sodium bicarb, which is carried by all of the ACP services. Okay, so we all remember when we were in ACP school and maybe uh, somewhere in PCP school, uh, we have a there's, a, there's a whole plethora of indications for uh, for a bicarb administration, and we've never we've never had a directive. Um, so we look at this like the phenobarbital, tegrasol, the tricyclic antidepressant overdose. Uh, those are the sodium donors again. Uh, the Benadryl overdose uh, ends up being a sodium donor. Uh, aspirin overdose, the same thing. There's a huge uh, 
huge movement of sodium. Uh, the hyperkalemic patient, the potassium overdose, the compartment syndrome, and crushing injury. Uh, these are the classic patients that will be in the hyperkalemic uh, status or state. Uh, metabolic acidosis, we would use bicarb uh, basically as a, as a buffering agent. Okay. And uh, the prolonged arrest as well, when the patient has been uh, in a prolonged arrest, and there's never been really a time put on it, but uh, as you know, they're, they're acidotic. And, um, you know, that's when we would be thinking about using this to uh, alkalize the blood uh, and as a buffer type system. So. so let's take those 12 indications and simplify them down into three. So the first is acting as a sodium donor, so the sodium aspect of the sodium bicarb. Second is the acidosis, so more the bicarb aspect of the sodium bicarb. And three, the management of hyperkalemia. So let's look at each of those individually. So for the first, for the sodium donor, it can be used uh, basically with an overdose of tricyclic antidepressants, which are a sodium channel blocker medication. So it takes the spot of the sodium in the sodium channel blocker. So talking about tricyclic antidepressants, they're generally prescribed for depression, anxiety, and for patients that have uh, chronic pain and fibromyalgia. There are some studies showing evidence in hospital, but we don't have any studies so far showing evidence for its use in out-of-hospital setting, the sodium bicarb for a TCA overdose. It can be considered in a life-threatening hypotension and cardiac conduction disturbances evidence on ECG. So let's have a look at what you might see on ECG with a sodium channel blocker action of the tricyclic antidepressants. So this here is a picture from uh, Goldfrank's toxicology book. On the top left corner there, labeled A, as you can see the very wide QRS, and that's what happens with the sodium channel blocker medication. So you don't get that upsweep on the uh, cardiac myocyte contraction. We won't go into the pathophysiology today on that, but that's what happens when you block the sodium conduction in the heart myocyte. B there, listed right below A, is what happened to the same patient after they were given sodium bicarb. So you're giving the patient the sodium with the sodium bicarb, and you can see that the QRS narrows, and you get a much nicer looking rhythm, as well as patient. And C there, listed on the far right hand side, is again the same patient, and that's nine hours into therapy after they've received sodium bicarb bolus initially, and then a sodium bicarb infusion, so continuing to give further sodium, combating the action of the TCA, which is the sodium channel blocker. But remember, with any type of patient who you see an ECG strip like in A there, first priorities take precedence. So this patient would require the usual CAB management. So looking at the evidence then for pre-hospital management of tricyclic antidepressants. Um, the latest practice guideline was published in 2007 by the American Association of Poison Control Centers and said that sodium bicarb might be beneficial for those patients that have life-threatening hypotension and cardiac conduction disturbances on ECG. But again, there are no studies specifically examining this therapy for pre-hospital, and so its safety and efficacy can't be proven. Um, so basically what to take away from that is that the administration of sodium bicarb might be beneficial for patients with severe life-threatening TSA toxicity, um, but that we should start with our general CAB management first. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So when we start talking about uh, bicarb itself, uh, for your TCA overdoses, we would be, remember this is all a patch point, and um, we'd be looking at one to two milliequivalents per kilogram of body weight. Uh, we currently carry in the trucks uh, 50 milliequivalents in 50 mLs. Uh, it is a patch point. And don't be surprised uh, if you get a, a larger order. Uh, you know, you'll have that discussion with the physician uh, when you're doing your, your patch. Uh, don't be surprised if they ask for more. Uh, generally, we carry uh, two amps in the truck, um, and you know you, you need to communicate that as well if you're only limited. If you have one or two amps, just say, this is what I have, and kind of go from there. Um, and don't be surprised for a TC overdose if they ask for two to three amps of a, uh, of a push for a, for a TC overdose. But uh, also, don't be surprised if you receive no orders for bicarb in that setting. So moving on to the second indication then for sodium bicarb is for the bicarb aspect of the sodium bicarb to be used as a buffer. 
So specifically for this, the evidence is quite poor. So there's no evidence for in-hospital, nor is there evidence for out-of-hospital use. It really is more of a last-ditch effort. And don't be surprised if, uh, when you're calling in and the arrest, if you uh, if you don't get the order. Uh, they may be a little hesitant on that. Remember, once bicarb is in, everything else kind of gets uh, uh, essentially destroyed <laughs> with the epinephrine. So, yeah. So some recent evidence in the use of sodium bicarb being used as a buffer is this case report which was published in, um, I believe it was the CGEM. Uh, basically it's the use in a pre-hospital resuscitation of a man with excited delirium who had an arrest following his uh, excited delirium uh, presentation. So it was used amongst a cocktail of other medications for suspected lactic acidosis um, and they really focused in this article about the sodium bicarb administration and that potentially helping this person. So it may help with the rule for the H plus or it may have been the other treatments that they had given this individual um, for hyperkalemia which brings us to our next indication third of three, so hyperkalemia. So patients that have hyperkalemia are, as we talked about earlier this year in our research, end-stage renal disease, compartment syndrome, crush injury patients, rhabdomyolysis, or potentially even a potassium overdose. So we'll go to uh, another poll question here. Um, true or false, sodium bicarb is the number one drug of choice for treating hyperkalemia. So we'll take about five, ten seconds there. Go ahead and answer at your leisure. Okay, so we can close the poll and we'll see how uh, everybody did. Okay, so 70% of the people uh, went with false for that question. Okay, so um, so 70% said sodium bicarb is a choice for hyperkalemia. Um, <clears throat> if we remember from our, is, is not, oh, it's false. Perfect, okay. So, um, oh, sorry, that was my fault. Uh, so 70% predicted it was false, and uh, that's, that's good. Um, the number one drug of choice for the hyperkalemia patient, as we remember from our research, is the uh, calcium gluconate. Uh, essentially, we want to, uh, the calcium gluconate is going to stabilize uh, that cell membrane and uh, and allow and and uh, sorry and discontinue um, uh, leakage of potassium into the uh, extracellular space. So good, excellent. So evidence for sodium bicarb. Uh, this is the Cochrane review that was published uh, earlier this year, specifically about the treatment of hyperkalemia, and it showed that, as we discussed from our poll questionnaire, that calcium is the medication of choice first to stabilize that membrane. It showed that bicarb may be helpful, again, in the cocktail of medications that we give for hyperkalemia, but that it in itself is not superior to the other treatments. So calcium is our treatment of choice initially in these patients. So this is an ECG of a patient that I saw earlier this year in Windsor. It was actually um, just when the research were first starting to roll out. Um, and this person had, as you can see, a nice wide QRS from their hyperkalemia. They were a dialysis patient. Um, and this is the sort of person who received calcium first. Uh, it stabilized the membrane. Um, and then we did end up in hospital giving a little bit of bicarb as well. But this is a nice real life example of a patient who pre-hospital had hyperkalemia and were treated successfully with calcium. I don't have the next uh, ECG to show you, but the QRS narrowed quite nicely with the calcium. So going back to something we've touched on a couple times, first principles first, your ABCs or CAB, and the evidence-based directive that we have for hyperkalemia, which is calcium. Okay, so looking at <clears throat> looking at bicarb, um, the three types of uh, the patients again, which uh, Lauren summed up, is the, the sodium donor, correction, sodium donor, okay, and it usually requires higher amounts, approximately three amps of bicarb. Um, the use, utilizing it as a buffer, we really don't have a lot of uh, good evidence to support the buffering in the cardiac arrest or the uh, the, the extreme metabolic acidosis patient. Um, 
So when we look at when we look at these uh, two to three, just going back to number one point. I'm sorry, uh, two to three amps uh, is is normal. Okay. Um, and the, but the bicarb does not treat uh, hyperkalemia very well, only if they're acidotic, and so there's no real evidence-based dosing for that. Um, when we look at point three, the, it's the same for the hyperkalemia we mentioned before uh, in the hyperkalemia webinar, uh, that the evidence for its use is, is poor. Uh, the one thing is uh, that uh, when utilizing uh, bicarb, uh, make sure um, to Flush the line well. If if you utilize, if you get the order for calcium, as well as bicarb, uh, ideally a second line would be best uh, to run them each in a separate line. That being said, if you're only able to establish one line, then flush it very very well because it does have a tendency to precipitate with the calcium on board. And uh, yeah, higher doses you may be required. So the bottom line for sodium bicarb then is that it's an adjunct to our evidence-based treatment for the three different modalities, which are sodium donor, acidosis acting as a buffer, and then hyperkalemia. But remember, sodium bicarb is an adjunct. The priority goes to what we know works, which is what's in our directives. So then a summary of everything we've talked about today are that our directives are what contain the evidence-based medicine for what we know works. Lasix we used to think had a role in management, but now it's been replaced with what we know works, which is the NOP, nitrates, oxygen, and positive pressure. With regards to sodium bicarb, you can consider it in TCA overdose. You may also get orders for it in an arrest and for hyperkalemia, but there's really only a potential benefit, no real proven benefit. And remember, <clears throat> for bicarb uh, utilization, we it is a patch point. Uh, we don't just give this on our own. We have to speak to a physician regarding this. Uh, and the dosing is going to be case dependent. It's going to be physician dependent. And don't be surprised if you do not receive an order or if you receive a, a large order for bicarb. So going over our objectives then, just recapping each of those points, because we want to make sure you take this away from today's presentation. So the pathophysiology of acute pulmonary edema, increased fluid in the lungs, potentially shifted, however, not necessarily an overall increase in fluid in the body, which is why our shifting management is preferred. With regards to the current evidence for pre-hospital furosemide indications, there's currently no real evidence to support it, but lots to refute it. And if we look at um, this evidence, we hope that after this, you'll be able to apply your critical thinking hat and say, this patient might be fluid overloaded, but luckily I have NOP to help me out right now. For the three primary indications for sodium bicarb, those are the, the, pardon me, the sodium donor acting as a buffer and hyperkalemia. With regards to the evidence, it's currently lacking, but unlike Lasix, there's no known harms for it. Um, applying the use of the pre-hospital sodium bicarb, um, you should know that you may get a patch in the circumstances listed above, so the sodium donor, so the wide QRS with an unstable patient with a potential TCA or other sodium channel blocking medication. Um, with regards to the buffer for the arrest and the hyperkalemia when you patch in for your calcium for the hyperkalemic arrest and for your arrest as well, you might get the patch for it. So if it hasn't been hammered home enough, one last time, stick to what we know works, which are our first principles, CAB, and what's in our directives for these patients. And with that, we thank you very much. So there's, there's one question that's come in here, and it's asking whether or not if patching for bicarb is appropriate in the treatment of a cocaine overdose. And uh, cocaine does have sodium channel uh, blocky properties. So in the setting of someone with an extreme cocaine toxicity, who you do a 12-lead ECG, and note that the QRS complex is greater than 100 milliseconds, I think that's an appropriate time to potentially call in for a patch for bicarb, given that the, the risk of this patient potentially going on to have a lethal dysrhythmia or even seizure is, is more so than when the QRS complex is less than 100. So definitely an appropriate time to, to patch in for uh, potential use of bicarb.
Um, just a couple other things I just want to reiterate what exactly what Lauren and Duane have said here is um, in terms of, of pre-hospital LASIKs, um, there's, there's great treatments out there and you're using them, CPAP and nitro. Again, the thought is we need to shift that flu. We don't need to get rid of it. We need to shift it because often patients aren't volume overloaded. And more so, just taking it to the next level, even within the emergency department, uh, we're seeing a transition, as, as Lauren said, away from that LMNOP, where Lasix is, is much further down on the list. And it's not used to be given as part of the cocktail. Everyone who came in volume overloaded got Lasix. But now we, we've realized how beneficial CPAP and, and Nitro are, that these are the, the best treatments for this shifting of the volume. And you have to think too, oftentimes these patients are hypoperfusing. So Lasix works at the kidney and you give the Lasix and oftentimes the kidneys aren't seeing any of this, this drug. So in the fact that you're giving it, a lot of the times it's having no effect on the kidney whatsoever. So in fact, you know, once that volume is redistributed and now suddenly the kidneys are getting perfused again, they get hit with this whack load of Lasix. And as Lauren said, oftentimes these patients aren't volume overloaded. In fact, they potentially even need fluids for you know, consider the, the septic patient who may be in pulmonary edema for whatever reason, a high output cardi or a high output cardiac failure. And now we're giving them Lasix and we're kind of behind behind the eight ball. So just want to reiterate that even within the emergency department there's a shift away from Lasix. So definitely, you know, in the pre hospital setting, evidence for it is, is definitely lacking. Okay. If there's uh, thank, no thank other you. questions coming in. We can say thank you to, to Dwayne and Lauren for presenting here today. And thanks for tuning in. That's great. Yeah. Hope it was hope it was informative. Yeah. And uh, we're just gonna see if there are any other uh, questions. There are no other questions um, as of right now. And um, uh, I forgot to introduce uh, Dr. Davis at the beginning of the uh, uh, webinar. Uh, that last question was answered. Um, by Dr. Matt Davis, who is the uh, Director of Education uh, with the Base Hospital. So let's just see if we have any more. We're just going to uh, keep it open a little bit to see, if, um, let's see if anyone has any more questions. Okay, well, it looks like uh, we have no more questions. Um, so I think that will be all. Uh, thank you for those uh, that attended today, and thank you very much for the, uh, uh, for the presenters as well. And you have a great rest of the day.